If you would, now turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And for those of you who may not know, on Wednesday night we've been going through the book of Revelation, so most of it's been pretty heavily on my mind, plus what all's going on in the world today. Make each one stop and pause. Matthew 25. And if y'all don't mind, or even if you do, I'm going to hold up this pulpit. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels and with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest we should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. Lord God, I pray we open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word. Lord, that you would pour your word into us and that we might be doers and not hearers only. Lord, now as I proclaim this message, I pray that I might step aside, that the word spoken would glorify you, and Lord, that we would all be enriched. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In chapter 24, the disciples had asked for what the signs of the second coming would be. And you know, he told them uh, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you do are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We know that Jesus has given us signs to look for. And as we look at the newspaper and open our Bibles, it seems like more and more is coming to pass. Screaming to us, be ready. Be ready. He could come today. It may be yet a thousand years. Every generation has looked and thought, sure, this world can't get any worse. But it is in a steady decline towards the cesspool of life. 
Things that were hidden in the dark 50 years ago are now openly paraded through the streets and accepted. Things that should not be. We see here that we are looking at a wedding. Ten virgins or ten bridesmaids who are waiting for the bridegroom to come. Now in the Galilee, their weddings were a little different than some of the other areas. There was the betrothal where the families got together and the bride price was settled, the dowry was settled. They were married. That took a legal divorce to be separated. But they did not come together. The groom would go to prepare a place for the bride. Usually a room on the father's house. He would have to provide all for their living, all the food and wine and marriage festival goodies. The bride would be getting her dress and her bridesmaid's dress ready. But neither the bride nor the groom ever knew when the wedding was going to transpire. You see, it wasn't the bridegroom who decided when to come back. It was the groom's father. That's like Jesus in His incarnation as a human told him. You know, I don't know. The angels don't know. Only the Father in Heaven knows when I'm coming back. So they didn't know. But they could look. They could watch. They knew if the groom had finished working on the home, the wedding wasn't going to happen. But if the home was finished, the provision stopped in, they knew that it could be any. And that's what Jesus is telling them here. Look at the signs. Look at what's going on around you and know when all the signs that I have given you start to come into play, know that the time is soon. And then one day, the father would look at the son and he would tell him, go get your bride. Go get your bride. Now those who were prepared and ready would hear the trumpet and the singing and the bridal parade being prepared and ready and coming. Those who may have been invited but weren't living in a state of readiness They would be sleeping. Content in the way that, well, it won't happen tonight. I'm fine. And as the bridal procession came, those who were ready would join. Those who weren't ready would be left out. The groom would 
come to the bride's home. They had a seat on two poles and she would come out, she'd sit down and they'd lift her up and parade her back to the home of the groom. They called this flying the bride. You see, all that is symbolic of what Jesus Christ says about His bride. The church. We don't know when He's coming, but we are commanded to be ready. There were ten bridesmaids, and that's what these virgins were, were bridesmaids. They knew the signs were ready. They knew it could be any day. Five of them had oil for their lamps. An extra oil. And five of them did. Five were prepared. Five were. You might say five, five of them were cloaked in the salvation of Jesus Christ. Five of them were professors, but not professors. Professor, they professed to have faith in Christ, but they did not possess faith in Christ. There's a lot of people out there, especially today, who profess in Christ, but they don't possess it. Some of it's the fault of faulty pastors who preach that, oh, you just flippantly say a little prayer and you're covered. Now, the sinner's prayer is absolutely necessary. What's behind it? The realization that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But the little words said at an altar have no magic without the heart's intent. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. And if you are saved, you are secure. Not by your own works, because we know that within ourselves there is nothing good, nothing worthy. There's none righteous, no, not one. We can't earn salvation. We don't deserve salvation. People who say, well, I want what I deserve, they don't understand. All they deserve is to go to hell. That's all any of us deserve. Shut but up. by God's grace, He reaches down. And those who receive Him are His. They're saved by His mercy and His grace. Written on the palm of His hand, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me, I will lose none. No one can take them out. No one can take us out of His hand once we have been saved. But there's something that happens at salvation. You see, we are changed. God sends the Holy Spirit to come and live in our hearts. He changes us. Does that mean that we are now totally sinless? No, a Christian can sin and sin grossly. 
The Christian won't continually dwell in sin. And the Holy Spirit is steadily chipping in our heart. Mm -hmm. Letting us know this isn't the way right. to live. So what about those who proclaim to be saved but go out and live any way they want? So liberating when I found this verse. It's in John, 1 John, chapter 2, verse 19. It says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. When I was young in the ministry, there was a man that I worked with that I, I just prayed that he never told anybody he was a Christian. Because he was the most vile person I ever knew. The things he said he did and what came out of his mouth would just make you cringe. But you start questioning about his lifestyle and he'd throw that finger up. Always saved, always saved. And that is true. But is that is not a covering for sin. That is not something that allows us to say, okay, we're taking on fire insurance, but now we're going to live any way we want. No, in 2 Corinthians, it tells us that salvation is like taking our dirty, filthy clothes off and putting new, clean linen on. We're changed. And it makes a difference. And as we come to these ten bridesmaids, and we see the extra oil in their lamps, they were changed. They were ready. Their heart was ready. They were waiting on the bridegroom. They knew He was coming and they were asleep, but yet they slept with expectation ready for the coming of the Lord. And when they heard the trumpet sound and the music and the singing as the bridegroom came to get his bride, they were ready to be up and join in the bridal party. I will profess to be ready. They were together with the other bride, great, uh, bridesmaids. But when push came to shove, they weren't ready. They didn't have any oil. And the oil in this parable is like the marriage garments at the marriage of the feast of the king. The only people who could come into the marriage feast of the king were those who he had provided marriage garments. Anyone else that tried to come in was cast out. Cast out into the outer darkness where there was wailing and gnashing of hell. People don't like you to preach on hell anymore. It's not cool. It's not what we want to hear. And so many churches and so-called Christians are out there tickling the 
the ears. They're not worried about filling people with the Lord. They're worried about filling their churches with people. Amen. And wanting money. And the things that the world and society declares are success. The things of the world and the things of God are not the same. God calls for a servant's heart. For a people that will go out and tell others about Him. For a church that's on fire for Him and is ready to change a person's heart. One is wanting the people to bless them. The other is wanting to bless people. And so many churches get in the circle of well, we've grown so big, now we have to have money, therefore we have to cater to the desires of others. Therefore, we dare not offend anybody. If people come into the church and they're not offended by their sins, then the church is not preaching the right message. Amen. 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 Church is a place where brothers and sisters gather together to lift each other up for right living. Amen. Not a place that excuses wrong living. And yes, I know none of us are perfect. I'm far from perfect. Matter of fact, I fear for anyone who opens my closet door because the skeletons are going to probably take them out when they fall. <coughs> but I know in whom I have believed. And I know He's able to save my soul. I'm not resting on my actions to get me into heaven. I am resting on His promises. But His Word tells us to be separate. To be different. He tells us plain and simple, if you believe in your heart, and that's where it has to transpire. There is so much that we come to realize when we contemplate Jesus Christ. And it starts with our fallenness and the penalty for sin. Jesus never tickled ears. He clearly proclaimed the truth. He clearly proclaimed the truth. He backed that up by miracles. And He always met people at their needs. But He never excused sin. People point the finger. Well, he ate with sinners. Yes, he ate with sinners, but he didn't become a sinner. He ate with sinners to convince them of the sin in their life that they may repent, That's right. That's right. turn away from their sin, and have a newness of life. He didn't join them. He showed them how to overcome. Now, there's only one way to overcome 
And that's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's salvation. But as we are living, God starts another process. It's called sanctification. For where we are trying to be conformed to His image. God is conforming us. The Holy Spirit speaks to our heart about what needs to be cleaned up or changed. Yep. Our role is to yield ourselves to what God is saying. Is it easy? Usually not. A lot of you know I like knives and I like making knives. And you know, when it comes to the strength of the metal and the strength of the blade, you've got to heat it exceedingly hot. And then you dip it in oil. And that metal screams. Because it's been fired. It's been in the fire. And then all at once, it's rapidly cooled. But that process brings strength to the metal. Strength to the brain. And a lot of what we go through in life is God strengthening and building perfections into our life. And it doesn't come without, like the metal, hammer blows, extreme heating, being quenched, and then ground and shaped and polished. But the finished product, at least in my opinion, is beautiful to behold. It's a utensil fit for the master's hand. And that's what God is doing to us as we seek Him. He is forming us into a tool that is fit to be used by the Master. Is it easy? No. Is it something you can just sit back, rub your Bible, pray for, have enough faith, and it God's like a genie in a Bible? Oh. No. That's not the gospel message. That's the world's message. And it keys on our baser natures of greed, of evil desire. Of wanting more and more. You come to the pastor and say, oh, Pastor, I prayed and I prayed and prayed and I had faith. Oh, well, uh, evidently you didn't have enough faith. Maybe you need to put a couple more thousand in my bank account. Plant you some more seeds of faith. Yeah. No. No. We need to go to our God and our Father. If there's any seeds to be counted or planted, we need to plant them in our own account through faith. Does God say it's going to be easy in this world? No. He says, in this world you shall have tribulation. Yeah. 
But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. When we come to the end of our life, whether we're going to lay this vessel down, or as I hope, we go into rapture, We shall be glorified. Mm -hmm. We shall be like Jesus. Amen. But you cannot skip the first step. Without salvation, you'll never see sanctification. Without salvation, you'll never see glorification. But with salvation, we are guaranteed an eternity with God. So whatever transpires on this earth will be like a whisk. Can you even fathom eternity? Time without end? You get to thinking and it just gets so far out there it's just more than we can comprehend of goodness. But we must be ready. Yeah. You see, five of the bridesmaids knew the bridegroom was coming. Five of them thought they were ready. <clears throat> but they weren't properly prepared. Five of them were ready to meet the bridegroom. Five of them didn't have the holy oil. Five went into the wedding feast of the Lamb. <clears throat> Five went into eternal darkness. It is imperative that each and one of every one of us, each and every one of you out there, check your heart. Know that you know that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Yeah, Jesus Christ didn't be fired in churches. Jesus Christ is our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our Savior. All our life should be dedicated to Him. What we do should reflect that we are believers in Jesus Christ. Sin ought to break our heart. Stepping away ought to break our heart. Does it happen? Absolutely. But if it is happening repeatedly over and over and over again, there needs to be a checkup. There needs to be a checkup. Our Lord said you will know a tree by its fruit. That a bad tree can't produce good fruit and a good tree can't produce bad fruit. We must be saved. Once we are saved, we are secure. But we must know beyond the shadow of a doubt that salvation has occurred. 
their true living can be. And we can live in the joy and presence of our Father, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. And one another. Because we come together as a church family to strengthen each other. Amen. To lift each other up. Maybe to cry when we're hurt. Lift each other up when there's joy. And to spread the good news that Jesus saves. Brother Ralph, if you would come up. We're having a song of invitation. If you don't know Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. This afternoon may not come. Your number two hundred seventy-five. Sure two seventy-five. I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender.